Bully, what do you think about, like, the second show? Like, it, it, it explained to by Punk that it's almost like, hey, you know, there's obviously issues. There's problems in the locker room. At this point, CM Punk is like, you know what? I'm labeled as the enemy. Let me go. But Tony Khan creates another show, and I'm sure because of the ratings of Dynamite, they were very happy about having a second show. But what do you think about separating the rosters because people aren't getting along? Bigger picture problem here, and what was glaring to me in that clip is Tony Khan putting CM Punk in charge of not just another show, but the boys. You want CM Punk to be in charge of collision? Fine. Take CM Punk out of the ring. The boys should never be in charge of the boys. Wrestlers should never be in charge of wrestlers. Wrestlers should never be telling other wrestlers what to do or not to do. The boys are in charge of policing themselves behind the scenes within the locker room. You cannot give wrestlers power over other wrestlers. It just doesn't work. But in this instance, at least from what Punk is saying, that the doctor told Jack Perry not to do it, then Tony Schiavone told him not to do it. And Tony Schiavone went to Punk and said, please help. And Punk was like, I don't want to be, yeah, I don't want to get is, involved. This, this is not a Punk problem. This is a Jack Perry problem. This is yeah. a snot-nosed kid problem. This is a punk-ass kid problem. And I believe every single last word that Punk is saying about Jack Perry. Because I had my own incident with Jack Perry in England a year ago. And there wasn't really an incident, because if there was an incident, Jack Perry wouldn't be around anymore. Jack Perry came off to me like a very disrespectful young wrestler. Especially when I went out of my way to introduce myself to him and extend my hand with a smile on my face. And I was treated like a, like a young boy by Jack Perry. Blown off, disregarded. And I see you shaking your head right now. And as God is my witness, should the good Lord strike me down with lightning, I'm telling you the truth. I, I, I'm not doubting that. It's just shameful that somebody as yourself being disrespected in that way. So when, when I hear these stories about a Jack Perry, like Punk saying that he carried himself in a disrespectful way where he wasn't listening to an authority figure like the doctor or he wasn't listening to an authority figure like Tony Schiavone or anybody else, I believe them because I witnessed the disrespectful behavior myself. Done to me. Sat next to this guy for three days at an autograph session. Never said hello once. And I don't want to hear the Bubba, you're intimidating bullshit. Because I ingratiated myself to this young man, this fellow wrestler. And I was met with disrespect. And I know I've been very positive about on this show when Jack Perry was in the ring. I enjoyed his story, his journey, yada, yada. Very supportive Jack of him. And Jack Perry's been a guest on this show prior where you've interviewed him. So creating the second show. I don't know enough detail about the second show. It sounded like Punk didn't want to be there. It sounded like everybody else didn't want to be there. It sounded like the uh, did not want him there. It sounded like the only person who wanted him there was, was Tony Khan because Tony Khan was a fan of CM Punk and having CM Punk on his roster. Yeah, but also 
I mean, let's give credit where credit is due, Bully. CM Punk is a star. CM Punk. But he didn't want to be time, there. It doesn't matter yeah, that he's a star. Yeah. I don't give a shit if he's Hulk Hogan. If Hulk Hogan goes to you and goes, listen, brother, I don't want to be here anymore. I'm uncomfortable. I don't want to be here. The boys don't want me here. This is obviously not working out for whatever reason. You got to cut me loose. Uh, I, I mean, Bully, I... I for me, business-wise, and there, and we're going to get into a lot about the business mind of Tony Khan, at least from CM Punk's perception. Listen, Bully, if you came to me tomorrow and you said to me, uh, Dave, you know what? Um, I'm not happy. I'm not happy on Busted Open. Uh, I got to be honest with you. I don't think the chemistry is there between you and I. You know, I, I, I just, I'm just not happy. I want to, I want, I, I want to go. I don't want to do the show anymore, dude. I am gonna do everything I can to, to. to I'm gonna. The first thing I, I'm not gonna say, okay, bully, you're unhappy. I want you to be happy. Why don't you leave? No, I'm gonna be like, dude, let's talk about this. I want you to stay. Maybe there's certain things we could do. Maybe there's a different time. Maybe a different. I am gonna work out with you a way where you're gonna be happy to make sure that you stay a part of Busted Open. No? But, yes, absolutely. But when you give a guy another show and the guy who's been around the wrestling business for 20 some odd years tells you, I don't think this is going to work because my heart is not in this place anymore. Obviously, everybody else doesn't like me. You can try to do whatever you want to make me happy, Tony. The other people are not going to be happy with me. Thus, it's not going to work. If I yeah. uh, oh, sorry, no, but I'm saying with collision, because there were people that absolutely loved CM Punk, um, and she said it on the air. Thunder Rosa's one got along with CM Punk. Big influence on her. She loved her time, and there's other wrestlers that have said that. Too. So I think what Tony Khan was trying to do is let me take those wrestlers that get along with Punk and have them on that show collision on Saturdays. But you are putting a Band-Aid on the problem and not trying to fix the problem. What Tony Khan should have done from Jump Street, what any boss, any owner, any matchmaker, any booker in this scenario from Jump Street, from the very first incident, is you have to get all of the people that don't like each other in a room together and work it out. You don't have to send each other Christmas cards. You don't have to text each other happy birthday. You don't have to be friends. But when you are here, I need you to be professional. And I have to, I need you to have respect for one another, and I need you to do good business with one another. But that never happened because the guy that owns the company doesn't know what it's like to run a professional wrestling locker room because he never sat under the learning tree of a booker or an owner who ran a professional wrestling locker room. Can Tommy Dreamer run a locker room? Yes. Why? He sat under Paul Heyman's learning tree. If you don't spend time, if you're not a Padawan and, and spend time around fellow Jedis, you can't learn how to become a Jedi. You can't buy the force. Tony Khan can buy a company. He can buy wrestlers. You can buy anything you want. You can't buy the knowledge of how to run a wrestling company, especially from the locker room's point of view. Now I'm going to say this, Bully. I don't know about Tony Khan as a boss because I've never worked for Tony Khan, but I will say this without hesitation. I agree with CM Punk about Tony Khan being a good guy. You were talking about that before, that you haven't had a lot of interactions with C uh, with uh, Tony Khan. I have. I have met Tony Khan on several occasions, and he is a super nice guy. And to the point, Bully, where, you know, I've seen him interact with my wife, Violetta, and be nothing but pleasant and nice. So as far as him saying that Tony Khan is a nice guy, he certainly is. And Tony Khan is a some is somebody that he'll ha I will always support Tony Khan and give him a platform on this show because he is 
a nice guy. I can't talk about him being a boss, but I will definitely say, without a doubt, CM Punk has always been a gentleman to me and my family and has always been nice to me and mine. So I he will, Tony Khan will always have my respect based on that alone. Any of the wrestlers that I've spoke to in AEW all have the same thing to say about the person and the human being, Tony Khan. So if I have a bunch of people telling that, I'm going to tend to believe them, even though I have not met him myself. You can see, like, when Tony, like, is around the boys. And, and yes, Punk is right. Tony wants to be friends with the wrestlers. It's very difficult to be friendly with your talent. Every owner and booker has drawn the line somewhere. Because if history has told us anything, wrestlers try to become buddy-buddy with the booker, the matchmaker, the owner, so they can be in better position to get a push. It's the nature of the beast. Wrestlers try to buddy-buddy up to the office. A majority of them do. Some guys just think, well, I'm just going to let the, my talent do the talking. Meh, and that works for a small portion. I, I've seen things with my own eyes. I've seen guys and gals in this industry talk so much shit about the booker, the promoter, the owner. And then all of a sudden, they're in the same place at the same time. And it's like, oh, how are you? How you doing? So good to see you. Ba, 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 ba. Oh, by the way, can I get five minutes of your time? Can we talk about my push? So you, you can't be friends with your talent. You can be cordial with your talent. There's nothing wrong with, you know... Sharing a few laughs with your talent. I had a lot. Scott Demore was great at towing the line of boss and friend. This past year that I spent with uh, TNA, and I was only supposed to be there for three months, and it turned into an entire year and a couple more months because things went so well. Scott, Dem I watched Scott Demore very closely. When we were at work, a great leader, a great boss who had earned the respect of the locker room. He didn't demand it. He didn't command it. He earned it. And then we would all be out at night, probably downstairs at the bar or, you know, just congregating, laughing amongst ourselves, having a good time. A good, good locker room. Good guys, good girls. And late that, later on in the night, Scott would stroll in. Hey, guys, how you doing? What's going on? Making sure everything's okay. Chatting it up with the boys, blah, blah, blah. And then he left. A nice mixture of both. But not like palling around with the talent. Not hanging out in talent rooms or going out to eat with the, you know, you know going out to dinner, you know, stuff like that. You have to have that nice, happy medium. Vince, at one time, would eat with the boys at catering, Dave. Like, attitude era. All the boys would go to catering, and Vince would be sitting with us at catering. Sometimes he'd sit with me, Devon Dreamer, whoever. Sometimes he'd sit with Austin. So he mixed it up. He sat with everybody. And then, after a while, it was like, I could only be interrupted eating and trying to you know, be normal with my talent for so long before people just start pitching me ideas. I'm trying to sit down and eat with you guys and be friendly with you guys and talk with you guys about everything else other than wrestling, but all some of you want to talk about is your push and wrestling. I'm going to go to my office and eat. What do you think about what Punk had to say about that style? And I guess what we were talking about earlier about a certain style of wrestling, not necessarily storytelling for episodic TV. For Dead AEW. on balls accurate. But you only learn this, and the light bulb only goes off, and you only finally see the light 
once you work for the WWE. You will never learn it anywhere else. Why do I understand AEW so well? Why do am I so critical of AEW at times? Because AEW is just ECW with money. Take out the high spots, put in the violence. Take out the violence, put in the high spots. So I understand what it's like to be a young wrestler and wanting to go out there and do everything that you possibly can. Every spot, every high spot, every this, every that. Let's break three tables tonight. No. Let's break one table tonight. In ECW, it's like, all right, Devon, we're going to put uh, the three people through it. We're going to put three, three, three people through a table tonight. And then you get to the WWE and you learn that one 3D through a table and make it mean the most is the right way to go about it. You finally learn how to bring this all together. You finally learn how to take all of the high spots, all of the moves, all of the stuff that you do, and in the WWE, learn how to make it mean something. That's why I say I'd love for a guy like Kenny Omega to work with a Randy Orton because Omega and Orton would be amazing when you bring these two styles together and when Orton can show Omega that you only have to do something maybe one time to make it mean that much more. Take all... AJ Styles is the perfect example of this. AJ Styles was the AEW style guy in TNA. AJ Styles was the high spot guy, the move guy, the this guy, the that guy, but never really understood psychology until he got to the WWE. And now he will be the first to tell you, if you want to learn the right way, the WWE is where you learn the right way. Uh, again, for episodic TV, because I understand when it comes to a lot of independent wrestling shows, you know, you want to showcase yourself. You want to showcase your company because you're not going to probably play in front of that audience again because the next night you're going to be playing in front of a completely different audience. But that's not the case on national TV. What you're hoping is that somebody who's going to tune in one week is going to tune in the next week and the next week after that and more eyes are going to be on that product and you're going to gain your audience. When you're doing an independent show, you may not have that opportunity to work in front of that crowd except for the one night that you're working in front of them. So you're not thinking about, all right, let me hold back on something because I'll do that the next week or the week. Well, there may not be a next week or a week after that. So you're going to have to showcase yourself. Not the same thing, Bully, obviously from what you're saying, week in and week out on episodic TV. Absolutely not. And, we, and you know, throughout the years, we've seen the bastardization and the prostitution of moves where I, I, th- th- there's certain things that I don't even, I, I can't even buy into anymore. Like, it's beyond the realm of believability. And, and uh, let, we always talk about like a move like the super kick. One Shawn Michaels super kick is all it ever took. Well, I mean, I, I mean, think and to something so extreme as a Canadian destroyer, like Canadian destroyer is like the first time I saw that bully, I was like, holy shit. I thought it was the greatest thing I've ever seen. Now it's just a move during a course of a match, which is crazy when you think about it. Uh, Dave, the absolute number one best example of this is the DDT. Yes, that was a that was a punishing finisher that nobody could ever recover from, and now it's just uh, it's just like an arm drag now in matches across un, the un, board. Un, unless it's a uh, unless another wrestler presents a really good reason to me, anybody who's ever said to me, "All right, I'm gonna hit you with a DDT," and I'd be like, "Okay, then the match is over, right? You're pinning me right after that," and they're like, "Well, no, you kick out." I'm like, "No, I'm not." Unless there's a, there's a really good reason to kick out of the DDT, you won't see me kick out of the DDT unless it was, like I said, unless it made sense for an incredible false finish of what we were doing right afterwards.